All right, so we are uh, good to go. So what we're going to do today is uh, we're going to continue on with our look at Chapter 2. As I mentioned before, we're going to spend a lot of time on Chapter 2. It's a fundamental uh, skills chapter. But before we get to that, uh, a couple of things to uh, announce, make sure everybody's uh, um, aware of. So the first thing is, uh, is that uh, Social Media Professional Development Assignment 1 is in the books. Uh, and now we are ready to move on to assignment number two. And assignment number two in building your online presence is all going to be about uh, plugging you into uh, your community. Uh, where do you fit into psychology? Uh, where do you fit into this uh, social network? So for that, we're going to uh, have you connect with uh, professional psychology organizations. So these are organizations that promote psychology, that organize psychology, that host psychology conferences. Basically, these are the professional organizations that it's a good idea for you to be plugged into uh, at any stage of your career, but especially at this stage uh, when you're uh, developing your presence. So what you're going to do for this assignment is you're going to follow the following three accounts. So first off, we're going to follow uh, Saikai. So Saikai is an international honor society for psychology. Uh, it is uh, dedicated towards students and student advancement. Uh, we have a chapter here at IUSB. I'm the advisor for that chapter. Uh, we will be sending out invitations to people that qualify for this honor society uh, shortly. But uh, even if you're not a part of Saikai, they do promote a lot of uh, information for students. Uh, pursuing psychology and pursuing excellence in psychology. So that's number one, you want to follow Psychi. So for all of these in your uh, lecture notes uh, posted at Canvas, you have these slides. And to find Psychi, the easiest way is to just use their at uh, Twitter handle. So at Psychi Honor is this, um, the one that you want to follow. So use the slide and you can uh, make sure that you're following the right organization. So that's the first one you want to follow. Second one you want to follow is the Association for Psychological Science. This is probably the second largest professional psychology organization uh, in the world. And uh, this one uh, is at Psych Science. This actually has an upcoming conference uh, in Chicago that uh, my lab is going to be submitting two uh, projects to. So this is another great one to sort of know what's going on in psychology to, again, see who's doing new work. And uh, again, they oftentimes have opportunities for students as well. Um, they will post um, scholarship opportunities, internships, things like that on these sites as well. So that's the second one that you want to follow. And then the last one, the third one, is going to be the biggest uh, professional organization, which is the APA, the American Psychological Association a.k.a. the APA of APA style, which is what all of psychology uses when they're public, uh, publishing their uh, work. Now, for uh, the APA, because it's so massive, uh, following it is not going to get you that targeted uh, plug-in to your community that we're looking at uh, for this particular uh, part of our development. So what I want you to do is, rather than following APA in general, you can go to their subject website. So they are uh, divided into a number of different divisions. And you can find those divisions at uh, www.apadivisions.org. And there is over 50 specific areas of psychology that uh, the APA has separate divisions for. So what you can do is just kind of scroll through the, the APA divisions, excuse me, Click on the ones that interest you, see if they have an active Twitter account, and then follow that particular account. So for example, in the work that I do, uh, I do psychology of aesthetics, and uh, they have a society for the psychology of aesthetics, creativity, uh, and the arts. And uh, right away, you know, you can see that they have an uh, inaugural conference, November 2020, uh, at Drexel University. So a lot of good information. They have their Twitter page there, APA Division 10, is uh, this, uh, the Psychology of Aesthetics, uh, Creativity, and the Arts. So once again, just find one that is of most interest to you. What is your interest in psychology? And follow that particular division. And as I mentioned immediately, when I followed this, uh, I saw this particular post. 
Are you or your students interesting, interested in applying to grad school in the psychology of aesthetics, creativity, and the arts? Here's a growing list of grad programs. So this is one of the biggest questions I ever get asked from students is how do I find grad programs? How do I know where to apply? And if you're looking to go into the psychology of art, here is a ready-made list for you that would have been shared just because you were part of this particular community. So those are the three accounts you need to follow. One, Psychi, two, APS, and then three, your choice of any of the divisions of uh, APA. And uh, as we did for assignment number one, send me a screenshot of your following uh, of those three organizations via Canvas. And you can upload your screenshots to assignments, uh, step two, psychology organizations. And that's in Canvas, social media development. Um, in assignments, Canvas, social media development, step two, psychology organizations. And that will be due uh, Monday, February 3rd by midnight. Any questions about step number two? All right, so the social media professional development, that's one of the possibilities that we have for uh, bonus points in this course. We are now going to take a look at the next one, and uh, we're just going to, this is going to be the inaugural uh, week for this. And this is the Innovations uh, and Suggestions uh, program, and this is the weekly survey. So why are we doing this? Uh, the reason for this is uh, in this course and in all my other courses, I'm always trying to innovate and improve uh, the learning experience. I'm always trying to make it more effective. I uh, was trying to try new things that uh, might help you learn uh, better. So that's one of the goals of this initiative. The other goal is to actually uh, make you part of the course building process. So you are here more than just passive consumers of information. This is a way to actually make your voice heard and make you a part of uh, the actual creation of these courses. And uh, once again, it's a way to kind of connect you to the entire process uh, and bring you into uh, that uh, procedure. So uh, how are we going to do this? What is it going to be? Well, what it is, it's an anonymous weekly survey. So every week, and I've already posted it yesterday, uh, there will be a link to an anonymous weekly survey. And what I'm looking for is any innovations or suggestions you might have any sort of suggestions for the course, any sort of new techniques or new approaches or new ways of teaching that you might have heard about or you might have thought about, anything that you can think of that would make this course a better learning experience, I want to hear about it. So you can post those innovations and suggestions. And then once that those uh, suggestions are posted, I will go through, I will pick the top five uh, from that week and that will be posted to uh, Qualtrics, and then that Qualtrics survey will be posted in Canvas, and then you yourselves will vote for what you think is the best innovation and suggestion. Because while I might think that something is wonderful, you as a student who is actually in the experiential uh, position might think that that's not such a great idea. And I might think that something is not a great idea, and you might read that suggestion and say, as a student, I think that would be wonderful. So I really want to hear what you have to say. So you're going to vote for the uh, best innovations and suggestions, and your votes are going to be anonymous as well. So the suggestions will be anonymous, and the votes will be anonymous. So feel free to be as honest uh, as you can, because that is the best way to uh, move this uh, process and make it effective. So uh, to help motivate you for this, uh, I am going to be uh, giving bonus points for the writer, whoever suggests, whoever makes the top suggestion, whoever uh, uh, suggests the top innovation, they will receive bonus points towards their final grade. And you might be thinking to yourself, well, it's completely anonymous. How are you going to get the bonus points? And this is where the second important part of this comes in, which is the uh, random number generator. So the suggestions, random number generator. This is a random number generator that is now in Canvas. There's a link to it in the announcements and I'm going to show you what it is so that you can see how it works. So this is your suggestions random number generator and uh, what you want to do is hold down delete for as long as you want and then when you let it go it will have generated a, a seven digit random number 
Write that random number down somewhere in your record. Make a record of it that that is your random number for week number three because what's going to be entered into your suggestions is your random number and your suggestion. So that's the only thing that's going to be tying you to your suggestion. I'm going to see the random number and I'm going to see the suggestion. And what we're going to do is once these surveys are done and once the, uh, once the surveys are done, and once the uh, uh, tallies are in and the votes are in, I will post it to Canvas and say, this is the suggestion that was the top vote getter. This is the suggestion that came out on top. And then if, and this is completely up to you, if you would like to claim credit for that top suggestion, all you need to do is email me your random number through Canvas, send me that message and just say, oh, the top suggestion for this week, that's mine. I would like to earn credit for it. Here's my random number. And I will match it to the records that I have through Qualtrics. If, on the other hand, your top suggestion wins, but you don't feel comfortable taking credit for it, absolutely, you don't have to. It's not uh, required. It's completely optional. Um, so again, feel free to be as honest as you can, because that is the major point of this, trying to innovate, trying to improve, trying to make these things better. Um, and that's the way that we're going to get your feedback and at the same time protect you so you can be as honest as you need to be. All right, so again, the Qualtrics survey link will be posted in Canvas Announcements. Right now, the Innovations and Suggestions is posted. So go to Canvas Announcements, click on the Qualtrics link. It'll take you to a Suggestions page. Generate your random number, enter that in, enter in whatever weird and wacky idea you might have. And uh, at the end of the week, I'll take a look through those, pick five, put them in a survey, and we'll continue this process continually throughout uh, the remainder of this semester. All right, so your suggestions are gonna be due uh, every week by Friday at midnight. So you got almost the entire week to uh, make your suggestions, make your innovations, and then Monday morning, I will post the survey along with a link to next week's uh, possible suggestions. All right, any questions about the innovations and suggestions uh, bonus points opportunity? Okay. All right, so what we're gonna do now is we are going to start up on chapter two. So continuing on with uh, where we were last time in chapter two, we introduced the idea of central tendency. We introduced the idea of the mean. And uh, this time what we're going to do is we're going to have a very quick recap of the mean, the median, and the mode. And then uh, we're going to do some in-class practice. We're going to see how to calculate all this using Excel, how to do that very quickly. And I'll teach you, I'll teach you some uh, shortcuts on how to speed up your Excel, uh, your Excel skills as well. And then we'll have time for uh, extra practice. And then I'll make a note about the homework assignment uh, that's coming up. We have to combine numbers three and four, so I'll just make uh, an announcement about that. All right, so once again, the idea of central tendency. Whenever you have a huge amount of data, it is difficult for our human minds to wrap ourselves around that huge amount of data. We are not made to understand numbers, and a lot of numbers at that. Uh, there's a very famous study in cognitive psychology that says that your working memory has a capacity of about seven units of information, plus or minus two. That's why phone numbers are seven digits long, because that's about all that we can remember. So when we're thinking about hundreds of thousands of data points, uh, there's no way that our minds can make sense of that unless we can boil it down to a single uh, number. So that's what we're working on, boiling down all of this information, all of these scores, into one number that is representative of the entire distribution. So it's one number that can stand in well for the entire distribution. And last time we saw three of those, so we saw the mean, and the mean uh, for a sample, capital M for a population, Greek letter mu. Uh, the mean was the balance point for all the scores. Uh, it was the point at which the scores on the left weigh as much as the scores on the right because it takes into account the size and the number of scores on each side. We saw the second most popular one, which is the median, second most often used in psychology. And this one, rather than taking into account the size and the number of scores on each side, all that it cares about is the number of scores on each side. The median just wants to make sure that there's the same number of scores below it as there are 
above it. And for a sample and for a population, the symbol for median is median. And then lastly, we saw the mode. And uh, this is the one that is just the score that has the highest frequency in your distribution. Literally the most popular score, the most frequent score. And for a sample and population, the term for this is mode. And it is by far the one that is the least used, although it is used in often, often uh, especially in certain types of psychology studies, especially when you can't assign numbers to your different scores, your different variables. All right, so we also saw uh, what happens to the mean, the median, and the mode when you add in different uh, types of distribution, specifically outliers. So we took a look at the case of, the hypothetical case of Elon Musk uh, funding college students who graduated in a particular year, $60,000 a year uh, for them to graduate. What happens when they actually enter into our distribution? And we saw that the original distribution would have had a mean right there, but when you add in Elon Musk's hyperfunded students, that mean moves to that position right there. That's the new balance point. So the mean is highly sensitive to outliers, to extreme scores. Uh, it is not robust against outliers. We saw that the median is more robust against outliers. So there's your original median. There is your new median. So it moves less, still moves a little bit, but it moves much less. And then we saw that the mode in this case would barely move at all. Uh, it is the most robust against uh, outliers. So a very important lesson to remember, you need to take a look at your distribution so that you can think critically about which one of these uh, measures of central tendency is the most appropriate one to use will give me that uh, representative score of central tendency. All right, so what we're gonna do now is uh, we're gonna do some follow along in class practice. So if you haven't already, uh, you can open up uh, in your uh, Canvas in Excel sheets. It's uh, week 03, class one, practice chapter two, the mean. And uh, we're gonna do this, uh, take this up live uh, in class. So I will get that going and give everybody an opportunity to uh, call that up. All right, so this is the page that you're looking for. So there's practice and there's extra practice. Make sure that you get week three, class one, practice. Extra practice uh, is exactly that. It's extra practice. And uh, what we're looking for is these, uh, this data set here. So once again, let me just zoom in on this selection. So once again, what we have here is we have uh, three sets of scores. So we've measured 12 subjects and we've tested them on three different scores. So you can think of the X scores here as being their ability in math. You can think of the Y scores here as being their ability in music. And you can think of the Z scores here as being their ability in uh, uh, athletics, right? So we got math, music, and athletics. We tested every single subject on those three different abilities. What we wanna do right now is we want to uh, answer these yellow answer cells here by calculating the sample mean for the uh, each of these scores, calculating the median and calculating the mode. And notice that I mentioned sample mean. So again, read that capital M as sample mean so that you get into the practice of uh, distinguishing between samples and populations. Don't have to do it yet, but we are gonna have to do it once we get into the next step uh, of chapter two, which is variance. Okay, so first off, let's calculate the mean for the X scores, the Y scores, and the Z scores. So we're gonna do that down here in the lower left, and we're gonna pop in equals to let Excel know that we're giving it a formula, and then we're gonna write uh, the function for mean, which is average. So equals average, open parentheses, to let Excel know we're gonna give it some scores. Highlight the scores uh, for the X variable. So the X scores there, we highlight those. Close parentheses, we hit enter, and we see that we have a mean of 43.17. We wanna make sure that we enter that into our yellow answer cells. And what we don't wanna do is we don't wanna enter this in manually. 
because that 43.17 is not 43.17. So if we enter in 43.17, you're going to see that we don't have it correct yet. And you might be thinking to yourself, well, it says 43.17. Why isn't 43.17 correct? And the answer is, is that it says 43.17, but it's not 43.17. It's 43.16666666. And if you round off to 43.17 early in your calculations, which is what typically the mean is done, the mean is one of the first moves oftentimes in many calculations, you introduce error, that error can snowball, and you end up coming up with a completely incorrect conclusion, and that's not the way to do statistics. You want to do statistics, we want to be as exact as we can. Uh, we're dealing with people's lives here. We're dealing with the mental health and behavior of individuals. So you never want to enter it in manually. What you want to do is you want to use that equals function. Excel will carry all of the decimals for you, and you see that we got that one correct. So make sure that you're using the equals function. Do not enter these in manually. Uh, you will lose points uh, on your homework assignments. You will lose points on your exams uh, if you uh, make that error. All right, so let's do it now for uh, y. So once again, equals, average, open parentheses, highlight your y scores, close those parentheses, hit enter. We see that the mean for y is 50.08. Pop that into our answer cell using the equals function, and we see that we got that one correct. And then finally, for Z, for the Z scores equals average, open parentheses, highlight your Z scores, close those parentheses, hit enter, and we see that we have a mean of 68.08 for the Z scores. Pop that into our answer cells using the equals function, and we see that we have that one correct. All right, any questions on the mean? All right, everybody got those all correct? Perfect. All right, next one is the median. The median is uh, very straightforward in Excel. Uh, the fun uh, formula for median is median. And uh, once again, I'll just point out that Excel has a very nice feature. So when you uh, plug it, when you type in a function, it'll suggest what it thinks that you're trying to plug, uh, type in, and it'll give you a description. So this returns the median, or the number in the middle of a set of given numbers. That's exactly what we want. Gives us a little bit of confidence, especially in this early going. So open parentheses, highlight your z-scores, close those parentheses, hit enter, and we see that we have a median of 44. That is very close to the mean of 43.17. Pop that into our answer cells using the equals function, and we got that correct. So once more for the Y scores, equals median, open parentheses, highlight your cells, close those parentheses. We find that for Y, we have a median of 25 and a half. Pop that into our answer cells using the equals function, and we have that one correct. And then once more, we have equals, whoops, median, open parentheses, highlight those cells, close those parentheses up, we hit enter, the median for Z is 41. Pop that into our answer cells, and we see that we have that correct. So right now, before we calculate the mode, I want you to take a look at the means and the medians for these three scores. And notice that for the X scores, the median is very, very close to the mean. The mean is 43.17, the median is 44. However, Y has a very different median from the mean. It's almost twice as much. The mean is almost twice what the median is. And also for the Z scores, very different mean from the median. So it is important to take a look at your data and you'll notice that if you take a look at Z over here, the Z scores, there is a lot of outliers. We have a score of 263. We have a score of 145. We got a score four. We have a lot of variation in our, out, in our scores. We need to look at this data to see which one of these measures of central tendency would give us the correct idea. Because if you tell somebody, for example, that the typical student in your class scores 50.08 uh, on music ability, their impression of your class is going to be very different than if you tell them the typical student scores 25.5. So we need to make sure 
that we're getting those answers, uh, those measures of central tendency measured correctly. All right, last one here, we got equals mode. So uh, for mode, sorry, kind of jumped the gun, it's equals mode. Uh, you'll notice that we have three different types of uh, mode calculations here. What I'm gonna do in this class and in this course is I'm gonna use the one that's backwards compatible with the most versions of Excel because I'm not sure how uh, current your software might be either at home or the place you might uh, go to grad school or in the place you might work. Uh, so we'll use the one that's the most backwards compatible. In that case, it's mode. So mode is just equals mode. You open your parentheses, highlight your scores, close those up, and we see that the mode for the X scores is 15, nowhere near the mean or the median. We do it again for the Y scores, equals mode, open parentheses, highlight your scores, close those parentheses, we see that the mode is 22. And then finally for the Z scores, equals mode, open your parentheses, highlight your scores, close those parentheses, and we see that the Z scores have a mode of 104, and then we can pop those into our answer cells using the equals function, and we can get all of those correct. All right, so those are the formulas for the mean, the median, and the mode. We have equals average for the mean, equals median for the median, and equals mode for the mode. All right, any questions so far? Okay. So what we're going to do now is we're going to do question number one, part two. And for this one, we're going to take a look at what happens when you get an outlier in your data. So we have the exact same scores that we had before, but let's say that now we added a 13 subject and subject 13 came in and just annihilated every single test that we gave this subject. So in terms of math, maxed out the scale, scored a thousand. In terms of musical ability, maxed out the scale, scored a thousand. In terms of athletic ability, maxed out the scale, scored a thousand. Massive outlier. Let's see what it does to our mean, median, and mode. So I'm gonna keep our answers from the first part in view here so that we can see how they change. And in this portion, I'm gonna teach you uh, two things. Number one, what happens when you put in the wrong formula? And then number two, how to speed all of this up a little bit so we don't have to keep typing in the same formulas over and over and over again. So we'll start off with the mean. And what happens when you're working with means, medians, and modes is because the formula for median is median, and because the formula for mode is mode, and because you're gonna be doing that over and over and over and over again, at one point, your brain is gonna trick you, and you're gonna think that the formula for mean is mean. And you're gonna sit there, and instead of typing in average, you're gonna to say to yourself, oh, I wanna calculate the mean. Okay, equals mean, open parentheses. I'm gonna highlight these cells close parentheses, I'm going to hit enter, and you're going to get that warning message. This, uh, Excel is going to say hashtag name, and what that means is that is Excel telling you that it does not recognize the formula that you just gave it. The formula that you just typed in is not something that is in its list of formulas. So that's all that it is. It's just a warning sign. So make a note of these, know how to, uh, know how to interpret these, because Excel is very friendly in this way, and it's basically saying, you've given me something, and I don't recognize the name. What is this name? So you take a look at what you've done. So you can highlight the cell, and you'll see what you've written up here. And you can just immediately realize, oh, I made that classic error. I wanted to calculate the mean, and I thought the formula was mean. So we'll just double click in the cell, and we'll replace mean with average, and we'll thank Excel for giving us that little warning, and we have the average for, um, uh, for the X scores. We pop that up into our equal cells, and we see that we have that one correct. Now, when we were working before, we typed in the formula for average three times. We wanted to calculate the formula for average three times. We typed it in three times. That's not really taking advantage of everything that Excel has to offer because one of the things that Excel is wonderful at is if you're doing the same thing 
over and over and over again, you can copy and paste the formulas that you've used to do them over and over and over again. So for example, we just calculated the mean of the X scores with the outlier. We also want to calculate the mean of the Y scores with the outlier. And if we're doing the exact same thing, you can copy the cell that has your formula. And I like to use keyboard shortcuts, so I like control C, but there's a myriad of different ways to copy in Excel. I encourage you go on Google, check them all out, use the one that's most comfortable for you. But I like to hold down control and C. That's the way that I, uh, I practice copying. And then what we're going to do is we're going to move our highlighter for ourselves. We're going to move it to where we want to paste that formula and then paste is control V. And what we can see is that Excel has pasted and calculated the formula for the mean of Y. So it calculated the mean of X and then we copied and pasted that and now it's calculated the mean of the Y scores. And you can see that if we enter that into our equals function up here, we actually have that correct. So this is a great way to do the same thing over and over again. So we can once again copy the formula for the Y, uh, the mean for the Y scores, paste that into the next cell to calculate the mean of the Z scores, pop that up into our answer cell up here. And you see that we have that one correct. So we can do this and I'll let you do this uh, on, uh, I'm going to do this just real quickly for the mean and the, uh, the mode, but this is a way to massively speed up what it is that you uh, are doing in Excel. So for example, you can do it with any function. You can do it with the mean, uh, sorry, with the average. You can do it with the equals function that we use to put our answers into the answer cells. You can do it for the median and you can do it for the mode. So if I was doing this in my lab, and I had three sets of data, three sets of scores, and I needed to calculate the mean, the median, and the mode for all of them, I would calculate the mean using equals average. I would go equals median, open parentheses, highlight those cells, close those parentheses, equals mode, open parentheses, highlight those cells, close the parentheses, and then you can take all three of those and you can copy and paste those formulas three at a time, and I've calculated the mean, the median, and the mode for every single set of scores that I have. And then you can take that equals function and you can do the same thing and you can massively speed up your efficiency with Excel, leaving you more time to think about a question, for example, on an exam, and not as much time actually just sitting there typing it in. So I would highly recommend practice this copying and pasting uh, practice, you know, the multiple formula copying and pasting. There is a learning curve to it. It is going to take you a little bit of time to develop the strategies and, and your keyboard shortcuts or however you like to copy and paste, but the payoff is definitely worth it. And using techniques such as these, just to kind of give you a uh, foreshadowing of what's coming up, if you use techniques like this, you can actually get through your exam let me, let me rephrase that. If you use techniques like this and you know exactly what to do on, the, on your exams, you can get your exams done in about 15 to 20 minutes. You have an hour and 15 minutes. So what that means is that there's really only 15 to 20 minutes of actual statistical work that is being done in your exams. The rest of it is entering things into Excel and uh, thinking about what you need to do. Now, what that means is I don't expect you at this point to at all be able to finish your exams in approximately 20 minutes. However, the better you are at Excel, the more of that hour and 15 minutes you can devote to thinking about what it is that you should be doing and less time to actually typing in what you actually uh, need to be doing. So the better you get at Excel, the more time you're going to have in the exam to sit there and go, Hmm, what was the formula for mean? Let me look that up. Oh, it was average? Okay, now I know what to do. Bing, 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 bing. You're done with the Excel portion. So make sure that you're practicing those skills because it'll pay off uh, when you're under time pressures like in the exam. And basically, you will not be under any time pressure if you can get uh, your skills uh, more proficient in Excel. 
All right, so before we go to the next example, I just want to show you what has happened to the mean, the median, and the mode now that we've included these outliers. So first off, notice that for the means, uh, they have more than doubled in every single instance. So the previous means for the uh, X scores was 43. Now, because of that one subject, it's 116. The previous mean for the Y scores was 50. Now, because of that one subject, it's 123. Previous mean for Z scores was 68. Now, because of that one subject that blew the roof off of all the scores, 139. So you can see just how sensitive the average is, the mean is, to these outliers. However, notice that your, um, your medians have not moved very much. So even though this score is 1,000 and more than doubled all of your averages, all of your means, your median for X scores has gone from 44 to 53. Your median for Y scores has gone from 25 and a half to 27. Your median for Z scores has gone from 41 to 44. So not much of a change at all, very robust against outliers and then you can see here for the mode, because it was only the one score that was added, your mode has not moved at all because what score was most frequent prior is still most frequent. So the mode is incredibly robust against outliers. All right, one, um, one more thing that I want to show you uh, before we uh, turn it over to practice. So I'm going to let you complete example two on your own. This is, uh, again, a copy and paste sort of warm-up exercise for you. But what I want to show you uh, to end this in-class demo is example number three. And example number three is going to be your kind of critical part of your strategy when you're copying and pasting. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to show you what not to do. And then I'm going to show you what to do. So don't follow along with the not to do portion that I'm about to do right now. Just kind of watch and um, you'll see exactly uh, what uh, you don't want to do. So remember in that previous example, I copied and pasted the mean, the median, and the mode, and uh, I did it for all three scores, and then I popped it into the answer cells and everything was great. So if you come to something like these scores right here, you might think to yourself, I'm gonna do the exact same thing. So you go to uh, the X scores and you're like equals average, open parentheses, you highlight your X scores, you close those parentheses, we get a mean of 12.7, and let's just pop that up in here with the equals function, and we see that we have that one correct. All right, so we're confident we're gonna calculate the median, so we pop in the median, we open the parentheses, close the median, we calculate the mode, open those parentheses, highlight your X scores, it calculates the mode, and then we're going to take our equals function, and we're going to copy and paste that all the way down, and we can see that for the X scores, we got the mean correct, we got the median correct, and we got the mode correct. And we think to ourselves, that is awesome. I'm going to take these three functions, and I'm going to copy and paste them for the Y scores and the Z scores, because I want to calculate those three again. And I can take my answer cells, and I'm going to copy and paste them to pop those in, and something has gone horribly, horribly wrong. So you can see that for the Y scores and for the Z scores, three of those, well, uh, four out of those six uh, scores, four out of those six central tendencies, uh, we got incorrect. Three of them have not yet, meaning that we haven't gotten the correct answer yet. One of them has that hashtag NA. Hashtag NA means that Excel cannot even calculate what you're asking it to do. So this is different than hashtag name. Hashtag name means that Excel doesn't know what it wants, what you want it to do. You, you've given it a command it doesn't recognize. Hashtag NA, not applicable, means that whatever formula you've given it cannot be calculated, right? It's almost like trying to divide by zero. Excel just can't do it. So something has gone horribly, horribly wrong here because even though we have all of the X scores correct, we've messed up massively on the Y and the Z scores. So what is going on here? Well, it has to do with what we asked Excel to do. So what Excel does, when you take a function and then you copy and paste that particular function, Excel copies and pastes the function. So it'll copy and paste the cell 
that your function is in. So this is where your function is. But it'll also copy and paste all of the cells that your function is linked to where the scores are. And if you move this over by one, you also move each of these over by one, right? So it works as a dedicated block where everything is kept in exact proportion to where it was originally defined. All the cells are in exact proportion to where they were uh, originally. And what Excel will not do is it will not expand or contract these cells over here if you need them to for your second functions. And that's the problem that we've run into in this example. So we can double check this by taking a look. If we double click on our average for the X scores, you can see that we are correctly including all the scores from our X variable. We're including all of the X scores. So that's why that calculation was correct. But if you double click on the mean for the Y scores, you'll see that Excel has done exactly what we've asked it to do. It's taken that function and the cells that it was accessing for the X scores and it's moved it over one column. However, we're missing scores, right? At this point, we're missing scores down here and that's why it's incorrect. We didn't include all the Y scores. And the same thing for the Z scores. Except the z-scores are even worse because now we haven't included four of the z-scores. So bear that in mind when you're doing functions and copying and pasting functions, it will copy and paste the structure of the function and move that wholesale to wherever you paste your function. And it includes the uh, cells that it's accessing as part of that function. So what do we do to fix this? Well, this is where uh, developing your strategies uh, for copying and pasting will come in. So one strategy that I use is whenever you're doing something and you have a series of scores, oftentimes uh, you'll have unequal scores, right? So subjects drop out, uh, people can't complete all the tests. So you have an uneven number of scores like this. One strategy that you can use is start with the scores that are the most numerous. Start with the variable that has the largest number of scores and calculate the mean, the median, and the mode for those. So we're gonna calculate the average for the Z scores here. We're gonna highlight all the scores, close parentheses. We hit enter and now you can see that we have that one correct. Now we have the correct Z score. Once we have that, we can copy and paste this and you'll notice that now we also have the correct Y mean, we have the correct average for the Y scores. And the reason for that is because now, because we planned ahead and we started with the scores that had the most, uh, started with the variable that had the most scores, now we have a formula that will work for the smaller number of scores. So one of the nice things about Excel formulas, most of them will ignore empty cells. The mean, the median, and the mode will ignore empty cells. So we don't have to worry about the fact that there's empty cells there, Excel doesn't even uh, care. So we can copy and paste this, and we can see that we have the correct number of cells for the X scores as well. So we can do that for the median as well. So we'll highlight the Z scores for the median. Close those parentheses. We see we have that correct. We can do it for the mode as well. Highlight the Z scores because they're the most numerous. And then we can take those and copy and paste them. And we can see that now we have uh, calculated all of those measures of central tendency uh, correctly. And uh, the last thing that I'm going to mention before we wrap up and uh, open uh, the practice uh, portion of today's class, when you are copying and pasting, especially in the early going as you're learning, and especially in a potentially uh, high pressure situation, like maybe the first exam, uh, when you're learning how to copy and paste, always just give yourself a little bit of time and double click on the formula that you copied and pasted. So if you don't have these answer cells here and you're wondering, did I copy and paste this correctly? 
What you can do for the Y scores, for the average Y scores, is just double click on it. And Excel will show you exactly what numbers it's accessing. And then, you know, for the mode for the X scores, just double click on it. And Excel will show you the exact scores that it's accessing. And this is just something that can help you out in a lot of situations, especially as you're learning, because it's easy sometimes to, you know, when you're highlighting your cells, you know, to make an error and leave out a cell. And then all of a sudden, you know, you're getting an incorrect, it didn't work there, but you're getting an incorrect um, uh, calculation. Just double click sometimes in the early going, take a look at what's highlighted, take a look at what's being accessed, and it can save you uh, from making a potentially uh, costly error um, if you miscalculate something in the early goings. All right, so that's what I wanted to do for follow along in class practice. So you have the easy version of the copy and paste practice in example number two, and then a couple of more challenging ones in examples three, uh, sorry, four, five, and six. So this will be also practice in calculating the mean, median, and the mode uh, using copy and paste. So I encourage you to do that. And then uh, we'll just real quick wrap up the, uh, the what I wanted to cover portion of today's class. So you have that extra practice ready to go. So I highly recommend uh, complete that Excel, get that practice in, make sure that you're doing that wax on, uh, wax off. You also have extra practice. So there is a second sheet that is very much like this first sheet. But again, even though you might uh, know how to do it, even though you might know what the formulas are, it is highly beneficial to practice these until you get it fast. Because the more, the faster you are at Excel, the more time you're gonna have in your exam to just sit back, relax, take a look at the question, and uh, not feel any time pressure, and uh, basically maximize your, um, uh, your score on that exam. So I highly recommend do the extra practice as well. And then uh, just a reminder, um, now that we're kind of into the, uh, the pretest, um, work, if you don't get 100% on your pretest and you want to improve your grade, uh, do earn the mastery points. The quiz me option is one of the ways to do that. Uh, homework and post test will also contribute towards your mastery points, but in the MyStat Lab study plan, the quiz me option is the most direct way to uh, obtain those. And then the other thing is that uh, homework assignment um, number three and four, for this, there is um, there are questions about central tendency, but then there are also questions about uh, variability as well. So you now have the central tendency uh, portion of it. You can calculate the mean, the medians, and the modes. But we don't quite yet, we haven't covered it, we're gonna do it in next class. We don't quite yet have standard deviation and variability or uh, deviation sum of squares. So because of that, the original, originally it was due earlier, it's been moved to February 3rd at 11.59 uh, p.m. And it is one assignment, it's one combined assignments three and four. So just bear that in mind, we're, you, can, you can give it a shot, you have unlimited attempts, but we haven't covered how to do the standard deviation or the variation yet, the variability, sorry, variance. So uh, we'll be doing that in next class. All right, so that is uh, all that I wanted to cover for today. So uh, if uh, you want to call it an early day, feel free. Uh, there is about 20 minutes left in class. If you have any questions, call me over, and uh, we'll make sure everybody is on pace for uh, these measures of essential tendency.